Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 73 of the Crochet Circle podcast. I am waving. I hope you're all well. I hope your January was good to you. Um, oh, sometimes I have a month where I'm like, get to the end of the month and I think, where's it gone? What have I done? And I feel like I don't have much to show for it. I feel like I have boshed January, like... I couldn't have done more. That's how I feel. I feel like I couldn't have done more with my work time in particular. <laughs> I'll explain why. I probably could have done more crafting, but I've got an issue. Um, but in terms of work, oh God, I've just been on it, on it, on it. Like, powered through January. And I still feel upbeat and ready for February. So, <laughs> watch out, everybody. I am on, like, high, high energy. I, w I was just, like... I'm um, doing that kind of flashy hands thing, which is dangerous. It means that I, I, I'm just full of beans today. <laughs> Possibly because I'm on my second uh, dirty chai, which, you know, is quite dangerous. If you don't know what a dirty chai is, it's like a, um, a cafe latte. So I make mine on the stovetop. I use espresso and um, milk. And then I add in some chai spice. So if you can get the syrup, it's really good with the syrup. I've got powdered stuff at the moment. And that mixture of chai spice with a bit of caffeine. It's a real kicker for your afternoon. And if you've got a bit of a headache coming, um, it's, it can be really good at lifting a headache uh, um, away from you with the caffeine and the spices. So not that I had a headache. I just fancied a second dirty chai today. You can get it in all the coffee shops as well. If you ask them for a dirty chai, they will deliver and it's delish and powerful. <laughs> right, let's crack on and tell you what I've got coming up this month. Um, I have an old dog new tricks for you, which came in from Lisa, who is um, Lisa Raspberry Crochet, who's like lovely crochet clanner, as you all are. Anyone that we, um, watches or listens or engages, you're all, you're all part of the crochet clan. Um, and um, Lisa has been a long-standing crochet clan member, and she gave me this little um, tip. Basically, I'm going to try and show it to you and talk you through it as as I record, so that I can show you. If you're adding in a new colour yarn um, or a new yarn into your project and you're not doing it like a colour change. So what Lisa is suggesting, and I'm going to talk you through this and show you as I do it, is that you have an empty hook and you place it through the stitch. And then you create that loop with the new yarn that you are joining. Place it on the hook and pull it through. And then depending on what it would say in the pattern, put your hook into the next stitch and you would slip stitch to secure it down. But when you do that, you still get quite a lot of play with that stitch because the tail end, the bit that you would weave in, isn't really secured down. So instead of doing your first chain, if you've got um, starting chains, instead of doing that first chain with your working yarn, which is attached to your ball cake of yarn, you actually get the tail that you would be weaving in in your new yarn, and you do your first um, chain with that. And then you can do your next chain with your working yarn which is attached to the yarn and ball and what that does is secures down your stitch it means that it's not going anywhere you don't have that difference in tension which quite often happens um when you're starting off with that chain i also quite like it gives it gives you a slightly thicker amount of um stitch there as well i find quite often with um starting chains so whether it's two or three for a half treble or a treble in UK terminology, it's really thin and a bit paltry compared to the next stitch that you're going to make. So that thickens it up a little. And then you can just go on and continue in pattern and you've got this nice secured stitch and it evens out your tension. 
So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, which I think produces a similar result, but you have to be a bit more careful when you're marking up which is your first stitch, is again, put a bare hook through the stitch that you're going to start in. Place your yarn over and then get ready to do your um, slip stitch. Put your hook through and get ready to slip stitch. But instead of slip stitching with just the working yarn, slip stitch with the working yarn and the tail and pull that through. And that does the same thing. So you basically have two loops on your hook, but you have to pretend like it's one because all you're doing is securing down that tail and securing your work as it starts. And then you can go on and chain up for your starting chain from there. Again, if you want a slightly thicker stitch, then you could just chain up with the working yarn and the tail end, slightly thicker looking stitch, and then just continue on with your working yarn. And then when you come back to weave in your ends, you just need to remember that your end is going to be further up and your final yarn round that hook is going to be through two loops and you just need to pretend that it's one because you've got the working yarn and your yarn tail on there. But really good secure stitches, which means that let's say you're doing a round or a row. Quite often, if you don't secure that down, by the time you come around to finish off that round and join it, you've got this flappy extended stitch and your tension might be different in your first couple of stitches until you get into um, your normal tension for that row, this will help to negate that as a problem. So basically, when you're joining a new yarn, try trapping down your tail end at, in the first couple of bits of stitches. No matter how you want to do that, the action of whatever is your favourite way of doing it, the action of trapping down that tail end will give you better tension and a better structure for your um, crochet to work into either for the next row or for joining that round off. And these are the little tips, honestly, these little tips are the things that really elevate your crochet because it gives you consistency and great crochet is given through consistency, I think, consistency of gauge, of um, stitches of tension all of those things well gauge and tension are the same thing you know what i mean and um, it just is what really elevates your crochet and these little tricks and tips help help to do that um consistency is key so thank you lisa for that great little um tip there from it's not something that i would tend to use but that is only because I tend to use um, starting stitches and the reason I use starting stitches is um, one, to get over that issue that I have with the tension and two, because I don't like those little, <laughs> I'm going to use a Scottish word, skittery wee um, starting chains. I don't like the look of starting chains. I feel that they create too much like a chain space at the end of my rows or beginning of my rows or when I'm making round joins. So I tend to use starting stitches instead for DC, for half treble and for treble. And that's what's in all of my patterns. But if you are a fan of a, um, a turning chain, then that's a great tip for you. Shall we move on to finished objects? Um, <laughs> I mentioned a moment ago that I've got a problem. In the lead up to Christmas, I did a lot of sock knitting. And then between Christmas and New Year, I did a lot of knitted rib in particular on my cloud crop top, crochet top that I did, knitted rib and the cuff collar and waist for. And it was all one by one twisted stitch. And that repetitive motion has given me a problem with my right hand, which is a real concern because... Like that's why it's not only my livelihood, but I'm right-handed and everything that I do leads off of this hand. So even things like um, picking up the kettle when it's full at the moment is hurting my hand. Um, so I've been to my chiropractor. She's had a good go at manipulating it. 
She suggested that I didn't craft for a couple of days afterwards, and I didn't. I found that really difficult. And the problem that I've got is that um, I'm right-handed, so I lead everything with my right hand, and I can't just stop picking things up with my right hand. So what I've been doing when it comes to crafting is rather than my normal way of being monogamous and then just trying to work through like one design and one personal item, I've had to take on a few more. I haven't had to, but I wanted to. I want to be able to craft, but I've um, taken on a few more projects so that I can do a little bit on one, move on to the next, move on to the next. I keep my hands busy pretty much all day and all night long. I I'm always multitasking. It's what kind of quietens my mind. So um, I'm not going to... More than two days. For more than two days, I'm not going to not have something going on with my hands. Um, And so that means I haven't really finished a lot. I've done bits and pieces. um, Not as much as I had hoped, but I've been able to do a little bit on one project, break off from that, do another project, so that my arm, my hand is getting completely different movements from the different types of crafts and different projects. So I'm hoping it sorts itself out. I have another chiropractor's um, session next week. Um, But it can be really painful and I don't want to exacerbate it because this hand honestly is my livelihood for pretty much everything that I do. So um, I need to... I need to look after myself, really, and make sure that I don't make things worse for myself now. So, but let me show you what I have done. Um, I know I showed you this jumper last month. It is the cloud crop top. I just wanted to show it to you again because I have now wet blocked it. The cat loved it. It, it um, was down on the blocking mats and almost every night he could be find, found sitting on my jumper on the blocking mats pretty much in front of the fire so he's going to be very annoyed that I've moved it but if you watch last month's podcast you'll be able to see how much extra length I have managed to block into this um into this top and I knew that I would be able to because the rows run vertically which is always going to give me a bit more stretch um, I haven't tried it on I literally pulled this off the mats um, about 10 minutes ago so I um, will wait it shortly and let you know how I get on with it. But I can see already that I've managed to block extra length into it. And a, a pure wool jumper like this, whether I've knitted it or crocheted it, I don't tend to wash it that often. Um, good tip is if if it's not like dirty, dirty, and you're somewhere that you you get a cold climate at night... If it's going to go down to freezing overnight and it's not going to rain, just pop your woolens out on the washing line and let the frost get into them and that can really help to kill off some of the microbial activity that you'll get going in um, in wool. It doesn't necessarily need washing all the time. So my, like, my non-commercial woolens, my handmaids, really don't get washed that often um, because I'll stick them out in the line or I'll spritz them but you know as I have been known to do if I slurp soup down them then they get a full wash and block and that's how we deal with them but now that I've blocked the length into this it you know I'm not I'm not going to have to do it again for some time and when I do I'll do the same thing it will get washed and I will re-block it to get the length into it because um, it will probably want to ping back a bit to more closer to um, the crocheted piece that I had originally but good tip about washing line and a means of dealing with some of your woolens it would also work for blankets it would work for all sorts of things um, just you need you need it to hit freezing point outside and no rain because you don't want you just don't want wet clothes um, what else have I got oh there's something I can't show you physically because I don't have it anymore but um, the designs for Murit issue 2 have been released and I do have a bag in there. I was working on it at the back end of the summer and it's now out in the world Um, and it's basically like a little tote bag. It's got a leather handle on it which you could easily make up yourself from 
like a charity shop find belts that you cut down um, and it is made up with three different colours of yarn and the bag is called Drift and the inspiration behind it is the shards of glass that you find on um, on beaches particularly in Scotland and in the northeast of England. Um, this Murit is all about clear waters and I wanted something that wasn't really wave formation but had that link to like seasides and beaches and um, so that's where I took it from and the colours represent the lovely pastely um, and brights of sea glass that you get so the main yarn, uh, main colour yarn is quite a pale, not quite minty green, it's, a war it's quite a warm pale green um, borderline aqua um, and that is called, I think it's in Jolie, uh, is the name of the um, the yarn and it is by Wiku Yarns um, and then that is paired with two um, different colours of mini skeins from River Knits, one which is their bare and the other one which is basically like a rusty coloured. I'll have it all linked out in the show notes in case you want to have a look. And then it's striped and a new a new crochet technique that I have developed for getting really crisp, clean lines um, for colour work crochet like you've never seen before. Quite often colour work is done in a double crochet, UK terminology, and you get little dog legs coming out. And sometimes you want a much cleaner look like, than that. So I worked really hard to try and find a technique, um, well, not even find, to develop a technique that would give me lovely crisp colour work and that is what I managed to get with the drift bag. So it's a technique that you will see me using time and time again because um, it gives you a really good fabric. It's dense but it still feels uh, like pliable. It's not so dense that it's like bored um, but it gives you such a nice dense fabric that you don't actually have to line the bag, which I know puts a lot of people off. Um, lots of people don't sew, they won't, don't want to have to sew up a liner for a bag. And with this fabric, you really don't have to. Um, and I've also done it so that the, the pocket is your gauge swatch, so you have a chance to practice the technique before you go on and do the main body of the bag. So I will add photos into the show notes. Um, but that is all there, and if you're interested, issue two of Murit is coming out at the end of March. You can pre-order it from me in my shop, you can pre-order it straight from Murit. And if you're Canadian or US based, Canadian, if you're Canada or US based, you can also pre-order from Claudia at um, Crochet Luna and her Etsy shop. I'll link to all of those things in the show notes as well. So very very excited for issue two of Murit to come out so that is um drift bag and then what else did i manage see i'm saying i didn't manage to do much but actually it feels like i did i also managed to hack at my socks which i showed you last time around so i was testing the theory to see whether you could cut off cuff down socks and it would work for knitting or crochet, pick up the stitches again and then simply rework back down to the toe and it works. So I'm holding up sock bit that I cut off which is where all of the holes were. These were now just like beyond rescue not going to work. I cut them off just above the heel so I'm keeping the top ribbing and the calf bit of the sock. I picked up all the stitches on these knitted socks. I redid the heel flap and then I redid the decreases, the sole and the toes and it worked brilliantly. And um, given that I'm currently working on my Segway socks for um, crochet, although they are toe up, I see no reason why you wouldn't be able to do the same with a pair of cuff down crochet socks looking at the way that these socks are um, designed and how the different parts of the foot anatomy are worked in the sock. You would be able to do the exact same thing and with crochet I suspect the heel is far less likely to wear 
um, and you would be looking at maybe going from um, the bottom of the heel down. So this technique, if you've got a pair of crocheted or knitted socks in your wardrobe that are beyond repair, you think, just have another look at them. And if you did them cuff down, then you might be able to keep the top bit and um, redo the the heel down or, you know, the sole down, wh whichever bit. But it will not work if they were toe ups. You just, you can't really do that in the same way. I suppose you could with knitting if you grafted it. It just, it just wouldn't be as easy. What I thought was interesting though, because I've had these socks for a, a number of years. They are absolute firm favourites. And I managed to get the same shade. It's called Moroccan Tajine from um, Gilly at Fjord Fibres in her um, troll sock yarn. And I can see the difference between the original yarn and the new yarn. And you can see that there's a difference in brightness. It is subdued after washing and washing. And I, I put my hand um, made socks through the washing machine. I don't hand wash them. I'm too lazy for that. Um, but it's interesting to see that although there is a difference between the two, given that these have been worn for years, the difference maybe isn't as pronounced as you would think for something that's gone through many a machine wash throughout the years. But I, I have no issues with the fact that they are subdued at the top and brighter coming down from the heel and beyond. Um, I rather like it. It tells the story of their mending, the fact that I'm, I'm giving the socks another lease of life. It makes me very happy. So, yeah, definitely a technique. If you've got some worn out socks, have a look at them and see if you can still make use of part of your sock and make the changes um, on the, the bits that are rescuable, basically. I also finished off the second um, dining chair cover. So I managed to get that finished. Um, so we now have a matching pair in our dining room. And as I said in the last podcast, there's no like, recipe or pattern for that because no dining chair cover is going to be the same and I hacked at these seat pads anyway so but just to say I finished off that project and when guests come round they now also get a comfortable seat pad to sit on um, they're not expected to just sit on the harsh wooden um, chair so that's rather nice and looks great in the kitchen um, and then the other thing that I have done which I'm not saying this is definitely the issue but it may have exacerbated the issue with my hand I went on a wood working day a one day workshop with my friend Beck and we made it was meant to be a tea light holder and um, I turned mine into a wooden frame made out of pine wood and there was a lot of hammering and chiseling in this and of course it's all going onto my right hand and I'm death gripping the hammer um, so that may have played a part in my hand not uh, actually recuperating that well. But it was worth it, <laughs> honestly. I made a frame, like I made a wooden frame. Um, to make it into a tea light holder, it was meant to have holes drilled into it that would fit a tea light um, specifically, but I knew I just wouldn't, it's not the sort of thing that I would use in this house. However, give me a wooden frame to fill with wool and... I will find a use for that frame. So my plan is, I'm gonna have a look through some of the books that I sell in the shop. So there's like a microweave book and a pure um, weaving book, which is um, tapestry weaving. And there's also a mixed fiber macrame book. So I'm going to have a look at all three of those and work out which will work best within my frame but I think my plan is to use some of my natural undyed wools and to create a really lovely natural kind of cream greys brown colour palette weaving to sit in this frame so I don't know when that's going to happen at some point in the future um, but yeah I just I thought it was quite um quite an interesting way of <laughs> introducing wool into another craft. I love using different media types and I love mixed media projects and I think this will do very nicely. Um, 
And one of the reasons I wanted to show it to you is because it struck me while I was doing this project that, um, like, I was quite disconcerted about three quarters of the way through the day. Honestly, it looked like crap. <laughs> I was... I was chastising myself for the fact that, oh, I'm not very good at woodwork. I can't do that. It's not good. And then it's like, it's always the last bits of a project that pull it together where the finessing is done, whether that's wet blocking or, you know, using clamps and gluing something together and sanding it down. But, um, and I'm sure other people are the same way. Tell me if you are. But I put a lot of pressure on myself for my things to look really good from the off. I don't, I'm not particularly a fan of not being good at something straight away. And I just need to remind myself that that is totally okay. You don't have to be great straight away. It's a learning curve. And also that partway through a project isn't a valid time to assess a project and work out whether it's any good or not. You kind of have to get to the end of it to see if it works because it's the last like 10 to 20 percent of doing a project that makes it really really good sometimes you just need to power through something to find out whether it's actually worked or not i mean also sometimes you know initially from a project that it's just it's not happening you're not enjoying it and that's almost a different thing but um i i just need to remind myself that i like things when i've got to the end of them and I've done all the finessing like the finessing for me are the final bits of a project that make it really good and to not do myself down when it isn't just exactly the perfection finished project that I want it to be when it isn't there yet to remember that there's still more work to be done on it right on to en route and I have one thing to show you and one future project to share with you as well. Um, I have managed to put a bit of progress into my Segway socks by Diane at Addy Day Designs. This is one that is frustrating for me um, because I really thought I would have these done. But it, the design uses front post and back post um, crochet stitches. And that's like a whole extra layer of action on my hand and... Of all of the projects that have exacerbated it the most, this is the one because of that extra twisting action. I can feel it when I do it. It's like a diagonal twist, which is really, um, which really hurts me. So I've managed to do a little bit more on them. I tried them on this morning and they are a great fit. So um, I know they're going to be really comf comfortable and I wanted to be wearing them. And I I just can't yet. <laughs> um, so these are made up in a size 7. That's what I am. And they are a 25.5 centimetre circumference um, foot. Normally I would have a bit more negative ease if it was a knitted sock. But with crochet walls, these have got some stretch on them. It's not as much. So I've kept more closely to my um, actual foot circumference for the pattern rather than going down a hook size and um, sorry rather than going down a foot size and where I've had issues with crocheted socks in the past it's because I haven't I've come at it with a knitted sock idea for ease rather than crocheted and I've struggled to get them over my heel so I thought I would like maybe do a proper job this time with Diane's Segway socks. So these are being made in a Russian yarn that I was given by my lovely friend Stasia. And it's um, uh, like a blue and orangey mustard mix, like a real marl in there. And they're working up beautifully. I know they're going to be lovely and warm. And uh, yeah, I just can't wait to get these down on my feet. But that's just going to have to wait or it's going to be a very slowly slowly approach to this project um, because of the stitches um, but yeah they're working up really nicely and um, what you can see with the sock it looks a little bit like a flattened out slipper at the moment but I've worked the toe I've worked the sole and I've done the um, increases and I'm now just working on the decreases which form the back of the heel and then once I've um, finished working them up 
I'll be done with working in rows for the back of the heel and I'll, it will be back into rounds. And then it's a simple case of rounds back up for the calf um, which also finishes off the top of the sock. So I'm, I'm just not that far off finishing this first sock um, but yeah, it's a slowly, slowly project. What I have been doing is taking lots of notes so that when I come to do my second sock it's much easier <laughs> um, can't tell you how many times I've done a sock and not written proper notes on how many rows I've done how many rounds I've done what size hook I've used so I'm trying to be better with this and in particular I mentioned last month that I'm using um, knit companion to take those notes um, on my projects and I've heard from a few of you that you've taken a look at it and that you're doing the same so that's great I'm pleased to have passed on that information about knit companion um, because if it means that we've got great notes to go back on frankly um, it means that things like socks can be reworked like I was talking about the knitted ones um, less so for this project because they're too up but the more detail I've got on notes the better it is that I am coming back to that project and I would be able to replicate it again, which also means that I'm making more use of the patterns that I'm buying, which is rather nice. So, who knows where my segue socks will be this time next month. I'd love to say they'll be on my feet, but I just can't sign up to that, to that at the moment. So that is my major en route. Um, but what I wanted to do was show you what my next project is going to be because some of my projects are kind of coming to an end so I'm like, I'm, I'm future planning already and the one that I wanted to show with you, uh, share with you is by Jeanette at Air Crochet Have you come across Jeanette? Like, she's the design, she's the crochet designer that I want to be when I grow up She's just amazing. Like she is flying the flag for chic um, crochet for a crochet that is going to last in terms of the look of it. She's just wonderful. It's her jumper that is on the front cover of issue two of Murit, and her palette is beautiful. She just has a really nice design approach, and I I really love it. I, I honestly want to be her. I'm I'm. If I'm being really truthful, I'm like jealous of her designs, which is always a good thing. Like, it's lovely to see other crochet designers that are flying the flag for crochet and that spur me on to do better work, to do more work. That's how I feel about um, Jeanette's work. It's just beautiful. Um, and so I bought and downloaded today her um, Frida Shaw. Um, it's actually called Frida Sial, which I think is Frida Shawl. She's Danish and that pattern is available in Danish or in English using US terminology. So I will pop a photo into the show notes and I'll pop a photo up here. It's a 300 gram project, so it's going to keep me busy for a while. Um, I originally went to her website because she has um, another shawl which I really want to make which I think is called the falling leaves shawl something like that and I just I fell in love with that when I saw it on Instagram um, but she doesn't yet have an English version of that um, available but it is coming so that is going to be like next on my list and again I'm thinking with the leaves one I'm going to do that in natural undyed wool um, and as for the Frida shawl, I don't even know. I'm going yarn shopping in my stash to go and see what I can make it from. I'm so excited. It's beautiful. And I really can't wait to get it on my hook. And I just like, I'm totally inspired by her to think about my own designs and what I want from them. They're, they're beautiful. They're right up my street. And I just, I love them. Like she's so talented. She totally deserved to be on the front page of Murit as well, it's a beautiful design, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that on my hook, to be honest. That is it for En Route. So, a quick update on designs in progress. I wanted to show you 
And I'm going to try and do it this time without crinkling the microphone, but I wanted to show you my fall into winter blanket, which I have now pieced together, seamed together, and I'm just adding the border to now. So I've got about another um, 100 grams I want to add to this blanket. This is the one that I'm doing in the John Arbon Textiles Harvest Hues. And it's it's a decent sized lap blanket to be honest. Um, I'm going to reblock it again once I've added the border. It it's about thirty centimeters away from my nose, and I can smell the sheepiness from here. I love it. It's the same with my fjord fiber wool. It's got that nutty sheepy smell to it. Like there's a sweetness. Oh God, I just I just love the smell of wool. I was doing the same at the woodworking course. Like the first thing I did was sniff the wood. <laughs> I was such a sniffer, but I love it. Like I love the smell of different materials. It makes me so happy. So yeah, my fall into winter blanket is not that far from completion. And my job next week, so this is podcast week, next week I am just sitting for an entire week and I'm writing up designs and um, patterns so that hopefully like my next tranche of patterns will start being uh, released because I have got two crochet patterns to release and um, a knitted hat and mitten pattern to release as well. So concentrating on patterns next week. Um, but yeah, adding the border. Originally, I was trying to extend the coloured stripes into the border and I fogged it all back yesterday because I just thought it didn't look like it had a border and it made the overall design almost look incomplete. And so I'm going to try and get quite a deep border on this in the main colour, which is the blue spruce. So it's a nice tealy bluey green. And then I think, I think, I think I'm going to add tassels um, into each of the corners, like probably quite large tassels using the main um, colour and this pomegranate red colour because I've got more of this pomegranate red left over and within my patterns and my designs I really like to be economical with the skeins of yarn that people need so like I, yeah as far as possible I want people to not really have lots of wool left over you generally leave as a designer you give about an extra 10% leeway for people that don't do gauge swatches and don't like actually check their gauge so you give them a little bit of leeway but I don't want people to have like loads and loads of grams left over so this pomegranate one has currently got about 20 grams um, still available so I'm thinking pomegranate and blue spruce tassels at each corner will just just give it a little something something <laughs> I don't mind a tassel they're you know they're quite good fun so this, I'm, I'm hoping I'll have this done by this weekend. Again, it's one that I need to be careful with because it's now quite heavy now that I've joined all the four panels together. And that weight of a project is one of the things that's affecting my hand and will affect yours too. So, um, yeah, just to think about that, if, you, if you're on a big project, um, bigger projects are going to affect your wrists and your muscles. So that is my that is my design in, in progress. I would love to show you the other design, um, but it's it's in a, a new wool that's coming, and so I can't I can't show it to you yet because it's kind of embargoed. <laughs> um, and but I will be able to show you that probably me time um, uh, in the podcast. So yeah, I'm working away on that one as well, but that will be that will be a nice little treat for you in the coming months. We're gonna move on to feeling the habit. And I have been sent some wool or some yarn um by Claudia, who is Crochet Luna. And it smells lovely. <laughs> obviously sniffer um and i actually had a zoom chat with uh claudia last night we catch up with each other every now and then and just like shoot the breeze and talk about community and what's happening and um just have like a good old 
catch up. Claudia is one of those people, and this is what we were discussing last night, there are some people that just pull you down, like their energy pulls you down, and they just like, you you just know that they're negative people. And then you've got people that just brighten your day and just are full of like life and just go out and get stuff done and Claudia is one of them and it was just it was so nice to spend some time with her last night and just have a giggle and just like feed off her positivity it was it was really lovely so the yarn that she has had spun is spun less than an hour from her house in San Diego and it is 80% alpaca and 20% merino and it's really lovely. It's about 220 yards per 100 grams. And what makes this yarn different is that it's a Z-twist yarn. Most of the yarns that are available commercially are an S-twist yarn. And that just means the direction that it's being plied together. So most yarns are S-twist. Which means that if you are a left-handed crochet and you are using a standard yarn, an S-twist yarn your stitches is, are going to present really beautifully because you're working with the twist rather than against the twist. If you're a right-hander like me and you're using an S-twist yarn, then you're kind of unplying the yarn as you work with it and you're not getting that same crisp definition with it. So for a right-hand hooker, a Z-twist yarn like Claudia has produced actually is going to present your stitches beautifully and my plan is to um, ball this up and work with it and find a project that will really show off the twist in those um, stitches to be honest something like a positivity spiral cowl will totally do the job for that because you'll see the structure of the stitches and because it's a heading bone um, half treble as well then you're going to see it in the length of the stitches um, so I'm going to make something with this yarn to really show off how beautiful it is. It has such a lovely plump twist on it. I just know it's going to work perfectly. What I particularly love, and this is the thing I was discussing with Claudia last night, is that like the commercial yarns don't really do a lot for me. They kind of, from start to finish, there's no difference in the yarn or wool as you work from it. Occasionally there might be like a little bit where it's ever so slightly thicker or thinner, but not to any great detail. And annoyingly, you're more likely to just come across a knot, which is just annoying. With a yarn like this, however, there's character to it. Like as I'm working with it, I can see that it's slightly thicker and thinner, that I can see some of the fibers coming through. And that's interesting to me. I much prefer working with a yarn that is like this than working with a homogenous yarn that just is the same from beginning to end other than the colours. I just personally I find that really boring because there's nothing interesting to feel through my fingers. Like I love running. Let me show you. So when I'm when I'm working with a yarn, when I pull through to get my next length of yarn. I don't pull it and let go. I am literally pulling through and I'm feeling that yarn and I'm feeling for texture differences and slub differences and thick and thin differences and I'm getting to know that yarn. And I, I want those differences. I want that character because it makes it interesting for me when I'm working with it. You don't really get that with commercial yarns. So yarn like this, I'd... I'd I'd much rather work with this every day of the week rather than something that's come like off of a bit big machine. This feels like hands helped to make it. This feels way more special. It doesn't feel like a big machinery yarn. This is just, it's lovely. Uh, and this is why you get me working with like John Arbin Textiles, with the Rivenets yarns, because they're working with smaller mills and their smaller operators and the yarns therefore are more interesting there there are more um hand touch points in the making of those yarns and it shows and it's lovely to work with so 
Beyond all of those like really lovely characteristics is also the fact that it's said twist. So I will work up a swatch. I will work up um, this to show you what a difference it makes to your crochet um, and just make the point for Z twist. Claudia has more to come with this. Like she's on it. She is going to be doing something with Z twist yarn. So watch, watch this space for her because um, yeah, she's got she's got some exciting things in development and some exciting stuff hopefully happening um, this year. So more to come from Claudia, and I'm sure um, I'll be telling you about it as well. Right, final bit is quick news beats and I have two things for you today. First is that the next global hookup is on Saturday the 19th of February um, at 8pm GMT and then Sunday the 20th at 9am GMT. It's on Zoom and password and everything is in the show notes. I'll also pop it up onto Mighty Networks and add it into stories on Instagram. You're very welcome to come and join us. You don't have to put your video on, you don't have to put your audio on if you're a first timer and you're a bit nervous. Come and join us anyway, we're a lovely bunch. And um, yeah, it's just a really nice way of being with other people and being able to craft them. So yeah, if you want to come and join us, details are all over the place for you to find out where. The second uh, quick news beat is, um, just a bit of an, an, an announcement. I'm going to change up the podcast. I, I I have an inkling of how I'm going to change it up, but I need to check that it's going to work for the purposes of what I want. Um, it takes me a long time to do the podcast, and I don't mind the fact that it's very structured. I'm a very structured person, so that bit of it suits my nature. But it's a lot of work for like what is generally about 60 minutes worth of output and it feels like it's a lot of, you know, it's a podcast so it is a lot of monologuing but I would like to develop it in such a way and make changes that make it even more community focused and community minded. Like I am all here for our crochet community, for pushing crochet forward, for bringing the crochet clan together and for like helping people through their crafting journeys, for sharing my crafting journey and the skills I'm learning and I want to be able to do more so rather than being frustrated with it and pulling away from the podcast that's not at all what I want I want to find an easier structure for delivering it that means I can just be a bit more free and easy with it but still feel like it's structured um, but that takes less time which ultimately means I might be able to increase the frequency of the podcast that said, there are two things I really clearly want to achieve with it. The vast majority of you lovely, lovely people listen to the podcast. That's where you come from. You are. You, I'm probably in your ears right now, in earbuds. Maybe you're at the gym, you're doing your gardening, you're having a walk. You might be drowning out your children. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, most of you access this podcast through audio so I very clearly do not want to stop having a podcast that doesn't work for you so there will always be audio content and if I can do it right that content will always be done through Podbean so you'll be able to get it through Stitcher, Spotify, um, Apple Music, all your normal places for getting the podcast but what I would really love is to be able to still take that audio box, still be able to do video, but do it on a more frequent basis, so it might be more bite-sized chunks. So that as I'm really working through a project, you get to see me working through the project, rather than I start something in one month's podcast, and then sometimes I finish it by the next month. Like you're not really getting that journey, and I want to be able to share that journey with you, audio and video. One of the reasons for this also is that long form video is dying. It really is dying. And I'm not a massive fan of YouTube. So I'm looking to potentially change that up. Not ready to announce what it is that I'm going to do and what I want to do. And for my lovely, lovely patrons, I'm 
um, about to email you all and tell you what it is I am proposing because I would really like to get your opinion on this. I want to know, you know, as people that give me your patronage um, month in, month out, I really want your opinion on this. I don't want to make a change that doesn't suit you. So keeping audio, keeping video in some way or shape or form, um, making show notes easier to access and bringing more community focus to this. And what I'm really excited about is I think if this platform, new platform works the way that I want it to work, I will also be able to do interviews, really easy, quick interviews with people. So that might be people in the industry. It might be Crochet Clan people that can just jump on with me. It also means that if I've got like 10, 15 minutes, I can sit and um, like crochet with you. I can just go, right, I've got 10 minutes. I might be up a mountain. I might be out on a riverbank. I might be somewhere. But I will be able to just sit and crochet with you and show you what I'm at and we can have those shared experiences. I've, I've, like, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of months and at the turn of the year I, I really started churning my brain around it and like what changes I can make because I want to be more accessible but I want some time back or not back I want to be able to better use the time that I'm putting into the podcast to serve our community better like that's that's what I want so I'm going to try it I'm just going to try and see what I can do and if it doesn't work it doesn't work and I can always come back to this format but change is inevitable and change is good if I get it right (laughs) so I'm going to see where it takes us but I'm not going anywhere if anything you could see more of me and we can do more together that's what I would really love I didn't ever go into this um podcast to like be a podcaster I, I genuinely don't give a flying one about that I'm here for community to share skills and to share our common crochet language together and that's that's why I'm here and that's why I want to continue to be here but it's time for a change and I hope you'll come along with me on that journey so have no fear I'm not going anywhere but it's it's just time to change things up and see how else we can do this I'm excited. I hope you are too. I know that I'm kind of going, change is coming and I'm not necessarily telling you everything about the change. I just need to work it out and I need to make sure that um, my patrons are happy as well. So, yeah. More on that next month. And on that, um, the month after, we're actually away on holiday. I think I'm still going to be able to podcast, especially if I've put these changes in place. Um, so next month's podcast will be like it is now, standard in all the normal platforms. But I will tell you if changes are happening next month, what they are. Um, and then the month after that, we're going to be away. We're going to be in Austria. So I would love to know, have you been to Austria? If so, between Innsbruck, Salzburg and Vienna... What yarn shops should I be hitting up? Because I'm going to be in all three cities and I'm going to be down in the Hallstatt region as well. So Innsbruck, Salzburg, Hallstatt and um, Vienna. I'd love to know what are your experiences of Austria and will, like, I'm the one that's driving. So (laughs) I can drive us to all the little shops when we're down in Hallstatt and... Um, from what I see, the cities aren't like huge big cities, so actually they're easy enough for me to walk around and go and find yarn shops. So what would you recommend? I would love to know. And there might be, like, I might actually be able to podcast from Austria. (laughs) That's the potential of the change that I'm looking at, is I would be able to do stuff live and, um, yeah, I would be able to just, show off where I am and what I'm up to and yeah it would just be a totally different way of doing what I do so I'm very excited I hope you will be too right that that is it for this month I hope you have a great February um and that it is kind to you it's always a pleasure spending time with you I love reading your comments on um, on YouTube and on Instagram. Like, if it hasn't come across enough in this podcast, 
our crochet community is what feeds me. It, it is what gives me the energy to keep on crocheting things, to keep on doing crochet designs, to fly that flag for crochet. So I love it when you're in touch with me um, and we kind of celebrate crochet and all its beauty. So thank you for that. Um, right, I am off to edit a podcast and uh, cuddle a cat, go and find him and find out where he's sleeping. Mop up the coffee that I, well, my um, my dirty chai that I have just spilt everywhere. It's all over the wool. It's over my socks. Everything that now smells of coffee. So I need to go and deal with that. And um, generally just have a very crafty month and get some designs and patterns written. So enjoy February. I will see you in March. I am waving at you. Love to you all. Bye.